Okay, so welcome to this video, which is a really, really strange one. So I want to show off what I've been working on and I've been trying to figure out exactly how I should do it. So I'm actually on uh, my computer currently since the project on my computer. So I have a display capture going and this is my 3D Tiger model that I've been working on for some time. So that's it and kind of all of its finished glory. Now I just turned on a bunch of uh, lighting bells and whistles so that you can kind of see what it actually looks like in kind of its final face. So uh, all that really in the viewport would, would help me with is speed, but I'm going to try not to bother people with um, jargon of what I do, which is really hard to do because I want to share this with uh, scale modelers, but in a way that doesn't bore them to death. So <laughs> I'm going to try to give just like kind of a brief tour of it, stuff I did, talk about how it was made a little bit, and then that's probably it because I, I don't know how much interest people have in it. So this is the what I guess I'm calling the proof of concept model of my tiger. Now this entire project was born out of YouTube in the first place because when I used to do these tiger videos, um, I would always be talking about things and using scale models for things. And since I make 3D models for a living, I was like, God, it'd be awesome if I had a big, really well done 3D tiger that I could just zoom in and show people stuff on. So this um, is technically an October 43 production. Uh, Dave Burden pointed out to me that it's not a real configuration, <laughs> which makes me seem kind of silly since that's what I'm kind of constantly talking about. But I just had other obligations come up and I wanted to take it to the textured phase just so I could see how good it would look. So the only things that make it kind of incorrect um, as a tiger period would be that technically um, you may see the FIFL uh, V-duct there and then the mount for the the files themselves, but those disappeared in that month. But I couldn't find photographic evidence of it with the, the late pistol port. And I had just been working from specific tigers where I modeled the things exactly as I saw them. And I was like, well, it's a tiger. <laughs> so like, I just finished it. And then uh, I will obviously update it later and make it better. So um, I marked it though as a third company, um, 101st SS in Normandy which is a very famous tiger. If you recall, it's the famous shot of the one that looks like this. And I just I just dug what it looked like. So that's why I used this marking scheme. I just wanted to see what I could do, period. You know, because the object of the, the project was originally to do it for YouTube so I could do things like, well, I don't have it prepped for it at the moment, but I could kind of show you an example. Like, let's say... Um, Da, 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 da. like they deleted something they didn't but like let's say they deleted the um sea hook here uh so if i had a configuration of an early tiger i could just grab that and literally delete it and then bring in another piece now there are much more elegant ways to do that but that was sort of the idea and still is the idea for the video itself is to take i'll have all of the parts lined up in a in a big list and then for that video, whenever it changes, I'll put a sort of an illuminated red texture on what was about to be deleted. So like, let's say, okay, they deleted, um, again, this time, you know, the wire cutter. So if they were to delete that, this would then glow, then it would disappear, and then we would put it wherever it was supposed to be. So each stage of the month, um, I'll go through it like that and say, okay, now these things, and they'll all kind of light up which obviously isn't happening now because I don't have any of that ready yet. Um, and then it'll move to wherever it went to. And it's not a terribly complicated thing. Also, my apologies if, if any of my mousing around is making anybody nauseous. I'm not really sure what to do. I could just leave it sitting here all cool and talk, but um, this is just sort of what I do when I'm, when I'm doing 3D stuff. So uh, that was the original idea for the model. And then it came that I thought, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this exactly on YouTube, but... Um, I could do either a series of books, uh, and that's probably how it would be, or, or one book, but a series of books where you say, let's uh, let's use um, Shreda Panzeb Thailand 501 as an example. I would go through any photographs I could find and hopefully find a guy for each volume uh, that was really in the know on that particular unit, and then we could kind of figure out the best guess of what these things look like, kind of like um, what's in many, many books, you know, these marking options things, but we would do it up in 3D where the guy would kind of help me make sure they were configured correctly, unless I already knew that unit very well. 
and then mark them correctly. So then these books could be on a, you know, a unit or kind of like they do it on Tiger and Focus, a unit at a time. So like 501 in Tunisia versus 501 on the Eastern Front, because then they can be much smaller. I'm not sure how self-publishing goes yet. So that'll be something we have to get to. But then each um, vehicle would have very close up renders of like, let's say, you know, the, the top or the back, you know, you could get it basically pretty well down. I mean, there's not a ton of like unknowns, but to new guys there are, and even to me there are. So there's a big gap between what I know and what these like Tiger Expert guys know. And the reason that I'm doing these projects is just to learn um, what they know because I have to. So yeah, so I think the, the books is a really cool idea. And one of the things I was tra testing out with this project was uh, this particular rendering software, I was like, does it look good enough? So this is like the base model. And if I turn on a couple of bells and whistles, um, it looks like this, which essentially for the layman, I guess, is uh, occlusion and bounced light, which means like if you look at the, like right here, once I turn that on, it's a, it's a lot of settings that I have already programmed in, but that's a hot key to turn them on. You get the light, you know, bouncing off the thing more realistically. And that's, that's a very standard thing in VFX nowadays. So once that stuff's turned on, now keep in mind, I'm not a professional renderer. Um, I can render it from this scene. Let me see how long it takes. It doesn't take a terrible long time. So I wanted to see if these would be good enough for print. Now my background right now is pretty dark and the overall lighting in the scene is pretty dark. So I could do a much kind of more pleasant renderings, but all right, so that's done. So this is like the actual render of that. It's pretty clean. You know, it's all right. These aren't at, uh, you know, print resolution at 300 DPI, but I think it's good enough. So, you know, overall, the, the, this particular version of the model is successful in my opinion. Uh, I didn't beat it up, you'll notice, and I probably should have, but I just wanted to get a clean one first. So you can also, uh, there are things on it that you can move around. It's not rigged to move because I'm not sure if I want it to be able to move. I do have a, an intern that was a, a rigger that worked for me. I'm not sure if you can handle dynamic systems where essentially if the torsion bar moved and the wheel moved, it would push the tracks, you know, when it went over terrain. I know people can do that. I just don't know if my guy can do that. So if anybody sees this that doesn't know me personally and is interested in rigging it, if you're a rigger, uh, shoot me a message because I'd love to see it that way. So how do I explain <laughs> anything about how it was made? Um, so yes, there are 3D models. And part of this video was going to be me digging through um, ArtStation, so I suppose I can do that. ArtStation is a, uh, a website where people upload stuff, including myself, and uh, as well as Sketchfab. Maybe that's a better one to try. Now that's one where the people put 3D models you can view. And by no means, by the way, if anything I show is yours, I'm not trying to insult people. What I'm trying to show is why, why I felt the need to um, make the model. So I wanted to show some other people's tiger tanks and then maybe it would kind of help explain the intensity of what I was doing. So again, if this is your model, I'm not trying to insult you, but I looked through all these before I made mine just to make sure I wasn't being stupid because yeah, lots of video game models have been made, but if you look at them closely, uh, they, they don't really resemble real tigers. So if you look at this guy's here, first thing, you know, this is all just one big piece. These are T-34 waffle tracks. There's a vision port there. So I'm not going to pick this thing apart a lot, but, you know, accuracy-wise, he's made some, like, steampunk choices, and that's fine, whatever. But, you know, not exactly accurate. Uh, let's look at this guy, because some of them get pretty close. All right, so this one, again, is better, but super simple. Um, everything's overscaled. It looks more like a toy and it's a little bit crude. As you can see, like the dimensions are not correct at all. And stuff like this for the, you know, back in the day in like the old Call of Duty games was fine, but you know, we've gotten to a point now where obviously it's very possible. I haven't, um, analyzed like the Call of Duty World War II models. Um, I don't know if they had Tiger 1 in there, but obviously you can see here everything kind of overscale. Looks like a tune model or one of those World War tunes or whatever. <clears throat> and even some of the better ones, it like there's a fidelity of model that people make and then there's uh, like the how finished is it. And 
I just I looked around every time I'd see I don't know what's going on with the side of that thing but again you've got you know this one at least tries but you can see that it's sort of simplified and silly and whatever I'll grab one more here and this is not just um, well how do I it just it kind of permeates everything in in the 3d world uh, 3d artists in general are not like us so you know they do a fine job and they're probably much faster than me uh, or at the same speed that I would be for a project. But in the end, they are not accurate. So, you know, I've never seen a game res 3D model that was anywhere close to as accurate as this. And mind you, this is a little bit higher than game res. Any of you guys that play video games, the base model of this tiger is about 300,000 uh, polys, which is like 600,000 tries. It is not meant for real-time game engine stuff, mainly because I went so insane on things like the tool clamps, like there's leather inside here, you know, where it actually should be, and the, you know, wire cutters were made essentially like a model all their own. A lot of this stuff is way too detailed, but uh, that's that's for a World of Tanks model. It's not too detailed just as a model on its own, so it's great for rendering, and I can put it in VR as well, and I, I posted that in the Tiger group build. I can walk around this thing, and it's measured to the millimeter, so when you stand in front of it, it is the exact same size as a real one. So... It's more like a, it's like a level more so than a than an asset for a game. But I just wanted to see see a three D model for once that you could tell whoever made it knew something about tigers. You're like, yes, there you go. Um, and and before I uh, uh, get into a little bit of how I made it, I'll just point out there are mistakes in this still. Um, for instance, like where the shock absorbers sit, you can see those two right there. It they're mirrored and they shouldn't be. Um, that's uh, that's part of the video game world. We duplicate a lot of stuff from left to right because it, it's quicker. <laughs> so it's, it shares everything, same textures, same everything. And uh, I'll move it, but I realized that I had mirrored the, the scallops here, and they're not identical. And I did not have a schematic or any kind of orthographic view of what these looked like on the other side. So they're they're subtly different. Like this big notch here, I think, is... is supposed to be like over here so before I do any print stuff that stuff will be fixed um, and there's a few pieces of hardware that were left off like uh, if you look like here oh you, my mouse I don't think is showing on the on the thing so if you look at the things that hold the these open like there should be hardware there and on these things um, just ran out of time for the the kind of proof of concept and you know in, in the end I'll, I'll turn the wheels so that they're not all exactly the same that's just uh, because of the way they're made. All of these wheels are exactly the same. So they share everything, and it's much easier to make them that way uh, if they're straight. All right, so uh, let's get into a little bit, I promise, a little bit of how I make things, because I know there's lots of CAD people. All right, so this is 3ds Max. It's what I do for a living, one of the programs anyway, and I taught it for years, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um... So everything you're seeing is all of the unique parts of the model, which means that every single thing you see in the final model is just mirrored versions or duplicate versions of the things that are here. So like all the wheels, you can see that they're they're built the correct way, but when it's in the final scene, there's a bunch of them. So if you look at the wear on these, they're identical. Also, if you look at like the hardware, there's only going to be one per wheel, whereas on here, there's a bunch of them. They're just duplicates of the other one. So so how I actually built the thing, um, the measurements were a huge deal. I had to get stuff from Hillary Doyle was the base, you know, from, from all of his famous drawings. And then um, I got stuff from a guy named John Desilo, which was, it's kind of, it floats around. People have it. But, you know, here's an example of, of my Tiger folder. You have just different um, schematics here and different pictures of real Tigers and close-ups of things. Some of these are test files, but as you can see, there's tons of it. Here's another whole folder of just schematic reference. And so that took a long time to collect. So once you get that in there, and if I unhide this really quickly and just say yes, you can see a bunch of these little planes in here. That's where a bunch of references went because... It's not just like plugging in data. The way that we do things is actually a little bit strange in game modeling. So I want to try to show that really quickly. So I don't want to get into it too bad, but let's just say 
All right, I'm, in, I'm on the wrong layer. Everything that we do is essentially built out of a box. So anything that's not cylindrical, that is. So like if you take, you know, the periscope guard, for example, that would have been made out of a thing like this. I would have figured out its dimensions, which I can plug into this program, but I would kind of roughed it out and then started adding edges and stuff to it, which is kind of unrefined, to be honest. You know, you kind of push this stuff out, edges out like that. You can make extrusions. Let me turn this on. I promise I won't do this too long. You can kind of extrude things. And then unfortunately, again, because we're not doing CAD stuff, you have to kind of chop at things to make them work. Now, there are some shortcuts and there are, you know, things, but do you see how I had to cut that into place to do what I want it to do, which is to round off. Then I use this chamfer, which you can also see is a little bit wonky. It's not even, which I wish it would be, but that just means I have to delete the history. But you can kind of see, I just got to block that out kind of just carve it into shape and it's it's not the most refined whoa that's weird <laughs> it's not the most refined type of modeling now that i've seen how a lot of cad people do it i'm a little jealous to be honest so so once you do get everything with dimensions kind of built the heavy-handed way now this is the game res model so it's it's pretty light i mean not for a, a real game this this particular model is it's about a hundred thousand polys it's pretty high of, of all the unique stuff but then you have to make high poly stuff out of it because as you can see, the wheels look a little simplified, although they are quite high poly. So I'll try to do the simplest explanation of that that I can, but you can see that this stuff looks like the final will. And it, it's, if you're familiar with game modeling, it's simple, but essentially we take our, let me find something easy. We take our simple things, we'll use this guy as an example again. So you can see how high poly he is. We'll isolate him. So if I turn off these modifiers, I just cut it into the shape like I did. We use something uh, called uh, chamfer modifiers. There's a couple different versions, at least I do. There are other ways. Some people manually cut these lines in. But so when you see these little lines here, then you use a smooth, any kind of smooth. And what that does is it just, in, uh, it, it cuts in half essentially each iteration or it quadruples it creates four polygons where there is one for each iteration of this smooth so cutting these lines makes you subdivide those which makes tight edges that's all it is so now that looks like a cad guy's model would so we have this really weird way of going about it but as you can see this looks a lot more like a proper tiger than what you saw before so that's my high poly model now in a process that i'm not gonna <laughs> try to explain to anyone um we bake them to each other, so we have to bake the high to the low. Now, that the necessity of that is to UV the thing, which I'll try to show you very, very quickly. So if I grab a texture set, which is, let's grab the turret. So a texture set is all the different colors you see. So each color is all on one, like basically image for all of its textures. So if I select all of the objects that make up one texture set, you can see there's the turret set. And I'll just throw an unwrap on there real quick so you can see what it looks like. I'm obviously not going to explain how it's done specifically, but so this is the flattened faces of the turret. Each individual element is flattened like it's paper, like it's been skinned. So if I grab one thing at a time, you'll be able to see, like if I grab the mantlet, that's where all the pieces of the mantlet are, the sleeve, part of the ventilator, another part of the ventilator, the lid of the cupola, and so on. So that has to be done with every single part as well, which is another thing that a lot of CAD people don't ever have to freaking worry about. So in the end, uh, you end up in a texturing program. Now, I'm not going to go into that because I think it'll crash the computer while I'm trying to record this stuff. But as you can see, it's a little bit... <sighs> I think it's convoluted and stupid, <laughs> the way that we work. It's getting better. Um, but like... I feel like someone like me would fit in better with these guys that make replica parts for restorations instead of game models because I'm a little, well, at least with tanks. I mean, obviously for work, I don't mind cutting corners and making something look roughly correct. But for something like this, it's so much harder. And I think in general, it's so much harder. And I think we're, we're coming to a point where CAD stuff's being able to be used in video games, which I think will change things quite a bit. 
time I was just drinking water. So, uh, in the end, it's it's really hard to explain to anyone in the scale model community exactly what kind of a trip this has been. You know, the guys that helped me out, like uh, Burden and Vyacheslav from the Facebook group, it, it's just unbelievable. I, th I think David Burden didn't really want to deal with me most of the time. But Vyacheslav, um, he's a, a guy in Russia that I've met through our Facebook reference group, and he was literally climbing on the tiger in Russia, the one that's just sitting outdoors, measuring stuff for me. So it's been... The, the process of making this model was, like, unbelievable compared to... I mean, when I see the the product, I'm like, yeah, it's, that's awesome. But it's it's it took a lot longer because of my son, and I don't really have a lot of time to work on it. So I would, you know, I'd be watching the baby for days a week, and I'd have a day to work on it, and I would just crank. So I'm looking forward to doing the other projects with it. This is basically just me showing it off to the, the, the place that inspired me to do it in the first place. Um... So let's look at it a little bit closer, just like we would with a scale model. Uh, the Zimmerit, I just made a little bit more randomized. Uh, it was really grid-like originally, so I think that looks pretty okay. It's all texture, so I don't have to sculpt it or anything. It does a lot easier than uh, what we have to do with scale stuff. Um, overall, I think it turned out pretty well. I didn't weather it too much. There's a little bit of what we do... Um, sorry if that mouse noise is bothering you. <clears throat> Panzer Meister 36. Um, he complains about my mouse a lot. But like right here, we've got some lightened chipping with some dark chips in there. It's actually primarily, I don't know if I can show you how I did it because it, the process I used was, it would be irrelevant to a scale modeler, but it'd also be probably kind of interesting. I used procedural chips in primer red and, um, a rust material, but then I backed the rust off a little bit so that it always is inside of the reds for the most part. Then I do some hand-painted stuff. And then I would go back in and hand-paint the lightened base. So basically everything we do in, in scale is what I did with this guy. Some of it is a little more random because it's easier to do that with this. And I also I can look at stuff and say, you know, I hate that or I don't like that. Some of these splotches down the mud guards I'm not 100% in love with, but they're pretty good. They look random enough. I don't really like this kind of chip run here. I'll probably cut some of that out. So for the, the print models, what it'll be is um, the chipping and the wear I'll have a couple of presets of, and depending on the, the vehicle, I can just add those over top. So I'll want them to be really, really good. Some of the stuff you can't see. Oops, that's not at all what I meant to do like these things, um, that looks a little weird, and I didn't really bother texturing that because you can't see it, but a lot of that's baked on light, so that's why it's so dark. The geometry is, is correct, so if I make a version, for, forgive my undoing, that's actually how you have to do that. So that's a little weird in there, but I think for the top it looks okay. I went pretty light on the weathering on the engine deck and stuff back here. Um... It's a strange area, and I didn't have much reference of wartime stuff. There's also a little bit of hardware missing in there, but I think it turned out pretty okay there. This thing I like quite a bit, so I had to do quite a lot of research on, like, these clamps. Oh, the pivot's still in the right place. That's fun. <laughs> so uh, the jack, I think, is all right. I beat it up enough. I wasn't really sure on this handle. I think the, the 15 tons may have had wood-covered handles. Um, a couple of honest things is that one, these clamps are exactly correct, but since I couldn't get accurate information about the two-piece starter crank, I just left it off so it should be right here. I also left off the crowbar that should be right here just for time issues, so that will be added as well later. But I think this light turned out pretty good. I didn't want to weather that too badly. This gun material is a little bit too shiny still, but that looks all right. That was something I, I had to learn a lot about for this particular model. I wasn't terribly familiar with exactly what, how this was built, but it's actually built the correct way with like the correct pieces. Yeah, I mean, in the end, there's not much to talk about. I can just show you stuff. Like, 
That I used my real one as a reference, so I'm pretty sure that's the most accurate wire cutters that's ever been. Um, <laughs> let me turn the turret a little bit. The jack block I left kind of dark and a bit chipped up just because I think that's kind of what they look like to me in pictures. I haven't seen too many color pictures. This was modeled exactly off of my actual one. So it's, it's pretty accurate to the colors and everything. I left the wood on these other two kind of newer. Um, I think it looks okay. Very, very hard to nail down what metals should look like. But see, luckily here I can get a little bit of this... Um, well, we call it a roughness change. Let me undo my turret back around here real quick. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just turn it back. All right, so one thing I wanted to point out as well is so you see the roughness difference in the shovel. I've got that going in the paint too, and this is something... Here, let's get a little like dancing across that paint. See right there. So the paint is shinier than the rest of everything. And actually the green paint doesn't really have the same amount of sheen, but it is still shinier than the yellow. And that was just to kind of represent differences in mixing the paint. So I think it's something I wish we'd see more of in scale. But I guess I don't have a, a ton more to say about this stuff. It's, it's a fun model. I'm glad it's done. I wanted to share it with the channel, but I don't really know. Um, you know, it, it seems very weird to talk about because I can't really critique anything like the build because I made it by hand. So <laughs> it's really strange. So um, I think I will do a little bit of turnaround with it and that'll be it. I'm still here. <laughs> um, I'm going to slow this guy down a little bit. Just let him uh, slowly spin around. Um, so yeah, I do appreciate that everybody's been uh, still subscribed despite my not being around. I'm going to put up a video relatively shortly after this one where I discuss um, where I've been hanging out when I can't do scale stuff. So... Um, yeah, thanks a lot. This is my tiger, and I will see you guys hopefully doing some scale stuff soon. Uh, but my other video will kind of explain. I just don't... I watch my kid like 10 hours a day, and I when I do stuff, I have to do 3D stuff because it, it makes money for me. So um, thanks very much, guys.